All right, welcome back, everybody. Okay, so there's a couple things I want to do today. Um, the first thing is I'm going to talk just briefly about the second homework to clear up a couple of um, questions that I've been seeing a lot. And then I'm also going to solve the 2D Laplace equation for equilibrium heat distribution on a square. Um, okay. Okay, good. So on the homework, I just wanted to um, clarify a couple of small points. First of all, um, when I say to write a MATLAB code to approximate this integral by, you know, in MATLAB, I really mean this finite, I'm sorry, this infinite real valued integral, not the, the weird contour complex integral. If you do the complex contour integral, that's fine. Um, I don't know how you would do it. Um, but you can, you can integrate this one by hand in MATLAB. Just assume like a negative large lower bound to a positive large upper bound, like negative 10,000 to 10,000 with a dx of 0.1 or 0.01. And you'll get something out that's pretty close to the answer. Um, you'll recognize like pi or some multiple of pi popping out. Okay, make sense? Someone shouldn't be as hard as some of, some of you have been making it. Um, I know this is a little unclear, so I apologize. Um, and there was also, did everyone get the email about the typo in the second problem? This should be e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta, not z. Okay, so that should make it way, way, way easier. Okay. And I think that's it. That's all the clarifications. Were there any questions about this homework? Anything anyone wants to talk about? Yeah. Third one, we actually need to use that note or not. On the third one, uh, what note? Initial condition, for any reason. Um, the ones I solved, I didn't need to. I didn't solve all three of them, at least not like formally. I don't think you need them, probably. OK. Um, OK, good. Um, so just so that we know, I'm curious, when is the midterm? No, oh, really? That seems soon. Um, wow, OK, so the midterm comes out next Wednesday. <laughs> um, fantastic. And it'll be due on Friday. And I will be out of town most of the following week after that. So I'll be in for the Monday lecture, but I'll be in Germany on the Wednesday and the Friday after the midterm. And so I'm going to have my TAs give like a midterm solution session, uh, probably the Wednesday after the fourth, or maybe the Friday after the sixth, whatever, I'm not sure. Okay? Uh, so everything this week will be on the midterm. Wow, it's really next week. This is the end of January. Okay, so everything from this week will be on the midterm. Uh, everything else will not. And I guess I owe you a third homework, and I'll probably try to put it up sometime over the weekend. OK, good. Um, any other questions about kind of course logistics before we jump into math? OK. Um, so solving the Laplace equation in 2D is a pretty good exercise. First of all, it's, it's a differential equation that's actually useful. This is something that, um, you know, a lot of differential equations that you solve are so restricted or so there's so many assumptions that it's hard to see how that can actually be useful. Um, but solving the heat equation for an equilibrium heat distribution on you know, some kind of an object actually is physically relevant. Um, and this example, it's going to be a little bit long. It's almost certainly going to go past today and a little bit into Friday. Um, but there's going to be a lot of extremely important concepts that come up through the solution of this Laplace equation. So this is going to motivate like whole weeks of stuff that we're going to learn, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks. All right, so this is really, really important stuff. Um, I've decided to change my boundary conditions a little bit because I worked it out this morning, and my boundary conditions are like the worst ones you could choose. So, so we have this square or this rectangle, say, you know, x equals 0 to L, y equals 0 to H, and I had top and bottom uh, temperature distributions are fixed at 0. We have uh, you know, Laplacian of u equals 0 on this uh, 
this plate or this rectangle. And originally, I had a temperature distribution over here. But it's way easier if I make this left boundary condition 0 and I put my temperature distribution here on the right. OK, it's not like a huge deal. It's just I don't want to. I don't want to have to skip a bunch of steps at the very end, um, and this is a little bit more obvious what the math is. So you could switch these, and the math would get a little, little, little bit hairier at the end. Um, so I'm doing it this way. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. All right, good. So we're going to solve this problem using the method of separation of variables, which most of you are familiar with, um, and. How many of you are familiar with the Fourier transform or Fourier you know, series? OK, a few of you. So the method of separation of variables really is where Fourier transforms come from. This is why we do Fourier transforms in the first place. Um, so I'm hoping to show you something kind of new and interesting that you might not have known about separation of variables. So we will use the method of separation of variables. This is one of the most important things I'm going to teach you in this quarter. Of all of the things that you're going to learn, this is probably one that you're going to remember for the longest. And you know, just the intuition of how to handle the separation of variables is going to be extremely powerful. You'll be able to rederive basically everything I'm doing in the second half of this quarter if you know what's going on here. Um, the basic assumption is that we're going to assume that our function u so u is a function of x and y. So we're going to assume that u of x and y can be broken up into some function which is purely in terms of x times another function which is purely in terms of y. So this is some big F of x times some big G of y. This is a huge assumption. This is not a small assumption, right? This is a Big one. And we're going to get to why we would possibly assume that this is true later. Um, this is not obvious why this would be true, that you could decompose your function into you know, some function of space times some function of you know, x and y. But this is the basic assumption. This works for tons of problems, at least where your coordinate system really is nicely broken down into x's and y's. Okay. So if this was rotated, then this wouldn't be true at all. But I could always rotate my coordinate system so that it is true. OK, so we're going to make this assumption. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plug this in to Laplace's equation. So Laplace's equation is partial squared uh, you know, uxx plus uyy equals 0. So we're going to. Um, we're going to use Laplace's equation, so we're going to use del squared u equals 0. And we're going to use our boundary conditions. To find f of x and g of y. OK, pretty easy to state what we're doing. We're just assuming that there's some xy separation of the solution, there's some function of x times some function of y. And then we're going to use Laplace's equations and the boundary conditions that we have to find what f and y have to be. And the nice thing is that by doing it this way, we're going to get ordinary differential equations to solve for f and g, which is really, really special because we know how to solve this. OK, if there's any questions at any point, like interrupt. This is super important. OK. All right, so let's take this equation and plug it in here. So what is the partial of this with respect to x? OK, so f x times g, right? What's f double? What's the double prime of this with respect to x? Just f x x g. And the second derivative of this with respect to y? f times g y y. OK, that's Laplace's equation in this separated variables. OK, pretty straightforward. Um, now, the, the trick here, it's not really much of a trick, 
is to move, um, I'm going to move this term over to the right, and then I'm going to divide all of the, um, I want all of the functions of x on one side, and I want all of the functions of y on the other side. Okay? So I'm going to try to get something like fxx divided by f equals minus gyy divided by g. Okay, I just move this over, and I divide both sides by f, and I divide both sides by g. Okay, so this is purely a function of x, purely a function of g. Okay, this is great. What has to be true? If I have some function, you know, I have some function q of x equals some function p of y, what has to be true of both of those functions? Um, they can be zero. They can be zero everywhere. Um, they have to equal a constant. It can't equal x squared, and it can't equal sine of y. It can't equal just a function of x or just a function of y. It has to be a constant for this to be true. Okay? So probably the key part of the separation of variables is that you have these two expressions both equal a constant. This is really, really, really important. Okay? Any questions about why this is true? Does this make sense? Does this not make sense to anyone? I mean, this is the thing that is the most confusing about separation of variables the first time around, is why this has to equal a constant. But, you know, just try it out. Try to imagine any function that, that is not a constant, and this can't possibly be true. Okay? This method was invented. Uh, who knows who invented separation of variables? Any guesses? Not Fourier. It's older than Fourier. Good guess. Who? Oh, come on. Start throwing out names. Euler, Newton, no. Newton, uh, not Leibniz, but a follower of Leibniz. Not Gauss. Anyone else? Not Cauchy, not Riemann. What about Bernoulli? This is such an underappreciated mathematician. There's like four Bernoullis. OK, so this was invented by Jacob Bernoulli. Um, in 1690, that's really old. Um, okay, so in 1690, 100 years before Fourier, this basic idea came into existence by Bernoulli, and he was using it to solve um, a problem called the isochrone problem that's quite interesting. And I would bet good money that this is exactly where Fourier got the idea to have a Fourier transform. He formalized the solution of this problem and came up with Fourier transforms. A hundred years later, okay, so this was around for a long time before people got the idea, so it's not obvious um, what we're going to do. At least it's not obvious to me. All right, so a lot of stuff in math comes out of nowhere, um, but these things took hundreds of years to come out of nowhere. All right, so don't feel like you're just um, not getting something that makes you stupid, right? It took the smartest people in the world hundreds of years to figure this stuff out. Um, okay, so we have this basic equation um, for separation of variables, and what we're going to do is essentially we're going to solve these different differential equations. We're going to take the function just of x equals a constant, and we're going to solve that differential equation, and we're going to solve this function just of y equals a constant, and we're going to solve that differential equation. And the nice thing about these are that they're both ordinary differential equations. And we actually know how to solve ordinary differential equations. OK? So let's, let's just write this out. So f x x divided by f equals um, minus g y y divided by g. And usually the convention is to call that constant just lambda. We're going to use lambda just like we did in ordinary differential equations. It's just some number, lambda. OK, um, and so our first ODE is just fxx equals lambda f. This is an ordinary differential equation. This is just a function of x 
equals lambda times that function. This is f double prime equals lambda f. ODE. Okay, awesome, because we know how to solve ODEs. Um, and we have a couple of boundary conditions. We have um, f of 0 equals f of, sorry, f of 0 equals 0. And f at L equals this little function f of y. All right. The second boundary condition is a little weird. We're going to come back to this one later. So let's ignore that one for now. Okay, so this is ODE1 for um, f of x. And ODE2 is also pretty simple. We have gyy equals minus lambda g. And these boundary conditions are much, much simpler. We have g of 0 equals g of L equals 0. g of h. Good, thank you. Right. So this g equation, right, any of, any of this y varying part of the function, it has to be uniformly 0 at, at y equals 0 and uniformly 0 at y equals h. Okay? And my f function has to be uniformly 0 at x equals 0. And it has to be something else to satisfy this condition at x equals L. And that's going to be the last step is satisfying this boundary condition. Okay. Um, now, a couple of interesting things. Laplace's equation is solved for every lambda you can name. For any number lambda, Laplace's equation is going to be solved by these two ODEs. Okay. This came from Laplace's equation. But the boundary conditions are only satisfied for special lambda. Okay, there's only some special lambda that will satisfy our boundary conditions. When's the last time we saw special lambdas coming up? Eigenvalues, eigen lambdas. Okay, so these are going to play exactly the same rule as eigenvalues, but in this partial differential equation. I mean, these are basically eigenvalues of, our, of these ODEs. They're going to play the same role. So these special lambdas, um, we're going to use them to satisfy these four boundary conditions. OK? Any questions so far? We separated our variables, plugged it into Laplace's equation. We get two ODEs, and I'm telling you that this there's only solutions that satisfy our boundary conditions for certain special lambda. OK, so I want to give you the big picture before I um, actually go into the nuts and bolts. So the big picture is the following. So the first thing we're going to do, which of our boundary conditions are, are simpler? The, the, you know, the G boundary conditions are way, way, way simpler. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to solve, um, we're going to solve ODE2 for G of Y. And we're going to solve ODE2 for G of Y. And since these boundary conditions are simple, we're going to find out what lambda has to be to satisfy these boundary conditions. So and find lambda that satisfy B, Cs. OK, so what kinds of solutions are there that, to these basic equations? These are like the, our favorite ODEs. We actually know how to solve these. These are linear second order ODEs. What kind of solutions can we get for these types of equations? Exponential functions and sines and cosines. So for example, if lambda was positive, I'd get sines and cosines popping out of here. If lambda was negative, I'd get exponentials popping out of here. Ex uh, unstable and stable exponentials. So to satisfy my boundary conditions of my function being 0 at the top and bottom, what kinds of functions do I want? 
sines and cosines. Exponentials can't possibly be zero at two places. They're not zero anywhere. Uh, so I need sines and cosines, and in particular, I need sines. Sines have lots of zeros on their period, right? They start at zero, they end at zero. So the, I'm telling you the answer to this story before actually deriving it, but the solving ODE2 for lambda, we're going to find that g of y are sines, and so lambdas have to be positive numbers where they have a whole period between 0 and h. Okay, like some harmonic sign between 0 and h. So lambda is going to be n pi over h squared for positive wave numbers n. And this is easy to visualize. Right, if I have my boundaries 0 and h, to have this be uniformly 0 on 0 and h, I need my functions of, uh, my functions of y to look like sines. And not just any sines, but sines that have exactly a period, which is you know, an integer fraction of, of, uh, of h. Okay? This is purely based on physical intuition. Right? We know that we have this boundary condition. We know what types of solutions we're going to get, and so I'm just guessing I'm going to have to have signs. And the only way I'm going to have signs that satisfy these boundary conditions are for exactly these lambdas. Okay? We're going to go through all of the gory details and actually solve this by hand. I just want, you know, this is, you should be able to kind of predict what your solution is going to look like before actually working out all the math. That's the interpretation part of this. Okay, so step one is the easy part. We solve this ODE, and then we find conditions on lambda such that this is satisfied. These are the conditions on lambda. And then we use these lambdas. We use these special lambdas in ODE1. And we're using these to find our F eigenfunctions, the eigenfunctions of this ODE. So now I'm starting to introduce some new language. We're dealing with eigenfunctions now. So lambdas are still our eigenvalues, but now solutions of this ODE are functions. These are going to be my eigenfunctions. Uh, they're going to turn out to be orthogonal functions, which is nice. And um, you guys have already told me if these lambdas are positive, these are going to be sines and cosines. These are going to be exponentials, right? e to the plus lambdas, e to the minus lambdas. Um, and if you add those up in the right way, these are going to look like cinches. Okay? And the last thing we're going to do is find the coefficient of these, the coefficients of these eigenfunctions for each lambda that satisfy this nasty boundary condition. Okay? So that's the big picture. We took Laplace's equation, we get two ODEs, and we have to pick lambdas, eigenvalues of these ODEs that satisfy our boundary conditions, and from those lambdas we find our eigenfunctions G and F. Any questions? I'm going to erase the left board slowly, because I want there to be questions at this point. Yeah. So I'm fast forwarding. Um, the basic idea is that I'm going to get stuff like e to the lambda. These are functions of x. I'm going to get something like e to the lambda x, you know, some constant plus some other constant e to the minus lambda x. These are really root lambdas. And it's going to turn out that these constants are going to be equal and opposite. So I get something like e to the you know, root lambda x minus e to the root, you know, minus root lambda x. And this is 2 cinch root lambda x.
So this is just from, uh, remember when we were doing complex variables, this is just how we define cinch. It's e to the lambda x minus e to the minus lambda x divided by 2. Okay? So when we satisfy our boundary conditions, we're going to find that these have to balance each other, and we get cinches popping out. And no, co no coshes, just cinches. Which is misleading, because this is not a cinch. All right, so that's a good question. Um, I was just fast forwarding because I want you to know the big steps that we're doing. We're going to solve for g and lambda, and then we're going to use those to solve for f. And this is going to lead to Fourier series, um, which is really, really important. Okay, so yeah. Uh, should we ever solve uh, the ODE 1 first if we see bad initial conditions? Or should we always start with the with the negative sign? Yeah, if you have better initial conditions, uh, boundary conditions for F, I would solve F first. Um, my choice of which of these is negative is completely irrelevant. I could call F hat negative F of X, and I could make my function negative and make this the negative one and this the positive one. This lambda is true for positive lambda, negative lambda, imaginary lambda, root 5 lambda, pi lambda, whatever. Like, this part, Laplace's equation, is true for all lambda. And then you find out that to satisfy these boundary conditions, lambda has to be positive. If these were the simple boundary conditions, then you would find out to satisfy these boundary conditions, lambda would have to be negative, right, to get signs up here. So it, nothing changes. It's just um, just like a relabeling of x's and y's. Okay, good. Uh, really good questions. Any others? I'm going slightly faster than I intended to. All right. So we have g y y equals negative lambda g, and we have g zero equals g h equals zero. So there's lots of cases. I told you, I already gave up the whole story, and I told you lambdas have to be positive. Um, they have to be very special positive numbers. There's not just any positive number will work. But let's try to see if we can derive this from scratch. OK, so the first case we're going to look at, case one, this is interesting. Interesting. And this is for lambda greater than 0. OK, um, I'm going to work this out in gory detail. So assume this is just like what we did for ODEs. This is an ODE problem like in 564. So we're going to assume that g of y equals e to the alpha y. So what's second partial derivative of g with respect to y? OK, so g y y equals alpha squared e to the alpha y. I plug those both into my differential equation. I get um, alpha squared plus lambda e to the alpha y equals 0. e to the alpha y can never be 0, at least for you know, positive alpha. And this thing has to be 0. So alpha equals plus or minus i root lambda are the only um, these are the solutions to this differential equations. And like we expected, we get sines and cosines out. For lambda positive, we get you know, e to the i root lambdas and e to the minus i root lambdas, and they give me sines and cosines. Okay. Um, so we have g of y equals you know, some constant k1 times cos root lambda where a function of y root lambda y plus k2 sine of root lambda y. And there's an i out here, i k2 root lambda um, sine root lambda y. And I'm going to choose my constant so that I get a real valued sine out, because that's the only way I can satisfy my boundary conditions. So we're going to choose k1 and k2 so that g of y equals sine of root lambda y. If you're really interested in this, and I think this is probably a good exercise, 
try to see if you can satisfy the boundary conditions if you don't make this assumption that you just get a sign root lambda y. Try to satisfy the boundary conditions with this cosine term. And what you're going to end up finding is that you can't do it, first of all. And if you tried, you would end up shifting your cosine until it looked like a sign. Okay? Okay, um, so this is the basic form of the function if lambda is positive. And what possible lambdas can we choose so that our boundary conditions are satisfied? Okay, so we have sine of root lambda y is g of y. And so g of 0 equals 0 is easy to satisfy. Every single lambda that's positive satisfies this, right? And in fact, that's the reason that you need these to be sines and cosines, because no cosines satisfy this, ever. But the g of h equals 0 is a little bit nastier. So that means sine of root lambda h has to equal 0. Um, which basically means that this thing has to be some multiple of um, pi. Okay, so this thing has to be some n, uh, n times pi for some integer n, right? Like this is only going to equal 0 if this thing equals n times pi. Not pi over 2, not pi over 4, but 0 pi, 2 pi, 4 pi, 3 pi, whatever. Okay, and so we can finally say, you know, root lambda h equals n pi, so lambda equals n pi over h squared. Okay, this, this is my solution in general, but the only lambdas that satisfy these boundary conditions are these countably infinite lambdas for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Okay. In the notes, I go through some detail, and I talk about the other cases, which are also interesting but less useful. Um, so case 2 is when lambda is strictly negative. And when lambda is strictly negative, what kinds of solutions do we get to this equation? We've already talked about this e to the plus root lambda y's and e to the minus root lambda y's and um, or the basic idea here is that we get exponential functions and they can never satisfy boundary conditions they can never satisfy these boundary conditions okay so we're going to throw away all lambdas that are negative we're going to go throw away basically all lambdas except for these very special countable lambdas. I say countable because there's infinitely many of these lambdas and you can count them all. Okay. Okay, this maybe, um, does this make sense? We're solving functions of G. The only way they can satisfy our boundary conditions is for them to be sines and cosines because they all, just sines just sines of these lambdas. Because the alternatives are cosines, which don't satisfy this boundary condition, exponentials, which don't satisfy either boundary conditions, or sines of other lambdas, which don't have this right boundary condition being true. Okay, so our boundary conditions have dramatically restricted the space of possible solutions to our differential equation. This is basically it. Okay, these two things, these are the only solutions of G that satisfy my boundary conditions. Okay, I told you that was the easy part, um, but it's not, it's not like the other part's really hard. So now we're going to use these lambdas, and we're going to plug them into our f equation, and we're going to solve for our eigenfunctions in x that satisfy our x boundary conditions. Notice that we've taken our PDE, and now we're just solving a bunch of ODE problems. This is awesome. We know how to solve ODEs. We're really, really good at ODEs. And so this um, general procedure is a huge simplification of the problem. Okay, so now 
we solve uh, fxx equals lambda f positive lambda f for the special lambda, which are pi n over h to the power 2 for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. And I'm just going to write this out long ways. So this is fxx equals n pi over h squared times f. Now, you can do the whole ODE thing, e to the alpha x. I'm going to spare you the details. This thing has solutions. Uh, what are the solutions? f of x equals what? OK, they're exponentials. Exponentials of what? e to the plus n pi over h x. There's some constant out here. Um, plus another constant, e to the minus n pi over h x. Those are the solutions. Right? I could solve my characteristic equation for this ODE, and I would get that my eigenvalues are plus and minus n pi over h. Those are positive numbers, so I get exponentials in those unstable and stable eigenvalue amounts. Okay, so from the left boundary condition, now like these are the solutions of my f functions. They're exponentials. So from our left boundary condition, what does our left BC tell us? The boundary condition is 0 on the left. This is the reason I chose to pick my boundary condition 0 on the left, because this is a huge simplification. So f of 0 has to be 0 everywhere. What's e to the 0 or e to the minus 0? 1. So a n plus b n equals 0. f of 0 equals 0 implies bn equals minus an. Awesome. And so what that means is that this is an e to the n pi over hx minus e to the minus n pi over hx. This is 2 cinch of this. 2 a n cinch n pi over h x. Awesome. That's our function. f of x equals this. Satisfies Laplace's equation. Definitely satisfies my left boundary condition. The eigenvalues that I've chosen are able to solve my y boundary conditions. I haven't solved my right boundary condition. That's the last thing we have to do. But we're in pretty good shape. We have f of x and g of y. So in principle, we have our solution to this entire Laplace's equation, u. Okay. Okay, this is about to get exciting to me. Um, because we're very, very close to writing down something that looks just like a Fourier transform. OK, so the solution, so our solution is u of x and y equals f of x times g of y. Now, we can write u of x and y equals a n times my function of x, which is cinch of n pi over h x f of x times my function of y, which is just a nice clean oscillating sign n pi over h y g of y. And I can actually 
each of these, for every n, for every positive integer n, these are each solutions of Laplace's equation. So I have a big sum from n equals 1 to infinity. Right, this is true for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4. This is a linear equation, so each of these solutions adds up linearly. And this is the solution to my PDE. Extremely cool. It's just this infinite sum of basis functions, of orthogonal eigenfunctions in x and y. g of x is times f of x is times g of y's. Why don't I have any cross terms here? Why don't I have like a sine h of, pi, of 5 pi x and a sine of 4 pi y? If they're orthogonal, they would multiply to 0. Um, well, they only multiply, they only integrate multiply to 0. They don't multiply to 0. The reason is because our fundamental separation of variables assumption was that f x, x over f equals minus g, y, y over uh, g equals the same constant. So if this is, you know, n equals 5, then this has to be n equals 5. I can't talk, you know, 5s and 4s or m's and n's. They have to be the same. Uh, this is the same constant here and here. Okay, the last thing we have to do, this is, this is um, super cool. The last thing we have to do is figure out what these coefficients are. Okay? And I fortunately actually solved this before coming here. I didn't think I would get this far. So last thing is find a n to satisfy our last tricky boundary condition. Okay, the last one's the hardest, and now we're able to uh, actually solve for this boundary condition. So in the next lecture, we're going to solve Laplace's equation on a circular disk, which is kind of cool. We're going to code up solutions to this for a particular boundary condition and plot it in MATLAB, see what it actually looks like. And then we're going to start thinking about how we would introduce Fourier transforms next week. I think. I haven't quite decided. But I'd like to introduce Fourier transforms because I'm about to do it right now. So we're going to apply our boundary condition on x equals L. And that says that u of L and y equals f of y. That whatever that arbitrary function was, my boundary condition. And so I have to plug in L for x. Yep. So that equals the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a n cinch n pi L over h times sine n pi y over h. This just has to be true if my boundary condition is satisfied. And now we're going to introduce the Fourier transform integral trick. And I'm going to integrate both of these from 0 to h. I'm going to integrate this from 0 to h. So, and I'm going to multiply them both by a sine of some other frequency in y. This goes back to the homework from 564 that showed that sine of 5 pi over hy is orthogonal to sine of 4 pi over hy on the interval 0 to h. OK, so I have integral. 0 to h of f of y sine m pi over h y dy. If this seems like this comes out of nowhere, it did. This is 100 years later. This came out of seemingly nowhere. Fourier figured out that this is a really important thing to do. So I have my sum of a n sine n pi over h y, that's this guy, sine of m pi over h y, that's this thing I multiplied it by, times cinch of a number, n pi l over h. This is just a number or a constant. 
And from the homework, we're going to revisit this. This integral is equal to 0 as long as n does not equal m. These are orthogonal functions. They will integrate to 0. Their product will integrate to 0 unless n equals m. So these are, orth are orthogonal, probably missing an a, if n doesn't equal m. And so the only way this cannot be equal to 0 is for n equal to m, or m equal to n. And so this integral equals uh, a n h over 2 times this constant, cinch of n pi l over h. This integral that I made up, I just cooked this up out of nowhere, Fourier cooked this up out of nowhere, equals this. I mean, actually, Bernoulli did this. Fourier formalized it and made a whole theory about orthogonal functions. Okay. The last thing, now we have a function for a n. So a n equals 2 over h cinch n pi l over h. These are all just numbers. This is a number. A n equals 2 over h cinch times this integral. OK, and I plugged an n in here because I need this m to be equal to n. OK, so this is the actual solution. The full solution that satisfies all of my boundary conditions is this function with these constants. And I can get those constants by taking my boundary condition and just integrating it with a bunch of orthogonal signs. So I'm taking my function, and I'm writing it in a new coordinate system in terms of these orthogonal function signs. We're going to talk about what that means later. But this gives me a basis for all functions, an orthogonal, infinite dimensional vector space basis for all functions. And this gives me the coordinates of f in this sine wave basis. OK, that's all I have for today. Tomorrow, Friday, we're going to go through um, different boundary conditions, MATLAB, and you know another cool example. No more super, super detailed math, but this is like an extremely important result. This is the basis of all Fourier transforms and how we solve much, much harder PDEs on computers and by hand. Okay, so this is like the future of how to solve PDEs. All right, that's it. Thank you.